Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with another of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today, we'll consider 10 extreme changes that occur the moment you're saved. And extreme they are, as far from one end of the spectrum of life to the other. These are facts most Christians know, but we thought it would be good to, as Peter writes in 2 Peter 3.1, stir up your pure minds by way of a reminder, putting them all together in one glorious list. So when you hear these amazing facts, remember that's you God's talking about. All right, miracle number one. We move from death to life. Right, I was thinking, you know, down in the south, they like their sweet tea. And uh, sometimes the sugar kind of settles down to the bottom and you have to stir it up to get the sweetness out of it. And sometimes these things that we know, we just have to take a few minutes to recalibrate and remember what an amazing thing it is. Every child of God is a walking miracle. The greatest miracle that occur when we're born again. So the first statement is, from death to life, most assuredly, this is John 5, 24, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And number two, from distance to nearness. When I was a little kid, the greatest distance I could think of was across the street. Mother would say, don't go across the street. It was a whole world out there for me to explore, but I had to stay in the yard. And then I found out about Grandma's house, and woo, that was a long way away across the city, you know? And then as I grew, I discovered we lived in a country called Canada, which was one of the biggest countries in the world. And then that our planet was massive, 25,000 miles around the equator, and then the sun was 93 million miles away, and my world kept getting bigger and bigger, but one day I discovered the greatest distance in the world is the distance between a sinner and a holy God. And so what Christ did in bridging this span, we can never imagine how far it is from a holy God to a sinner, but Christ was able to reconcile us and so we read in Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And number three, out of bondage and into liberty. Again, the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. This freedom, the truth makes us free, the Son makes us free, and we are free indeed. We should never take that lightly and put our hands back into the manacles of sin. Next at number four, from poverty to riches. We can begin to understand a little bit of how rich we are when we realize how poor the Lord Jesus became. The famous verse in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. He divested himself of everything. And one of the interesting ideas in the Bible is that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So when Christ died, God had entrusted everything to him to pay the debt of our sin. And the Lord Jesus expended all of it in dying for us. And he, in a sense, transferred that wealth to us in salvation. So we're heirs of God through the death of Christ. But then he rose again. And because God has an infinite amount, he can keep giving it away and never have any less. And he was so pleased with what the Son did that he gave the Son everything again. And the Lord Jesus said, I don't want this all for myself. I'm going to share it with my bride. And so we are heirs of God through the death of Christ. We're joint heirs with Christ through his resurrection. So we have two times everything. 
we should never complain again. And number five, from strangers to citizens. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. This world may be home to many sinners, but we were all strangers to God. We didn't know God. And one of the things the Lord Jesus did in coming into the world was introduce us to God, a God who was our size, a God we could look into his eyes. We could see what God would do at a funeral or a wedding or how he'd treat a prostitute or a leper. Christ was God manifest in the flesh. And so we who had once been strangers to God and didn't know God were able to meet God up close and personal. And so he took us who were strangers and he brought us into this citizenship. We are citizens now of heaven. We are welcome in the presence of God. We were persona non grata because of our sin, but the, the gate's been open wide and we can draw near to God. We who were strangers are now citizens. Next at number six, from darkness to light. They say that the uh, one-eyed man in the country of the blind is king. The fact was that we didn't even have one eye open. We were totally blind, totally dark to spiritual things. And one of the promises, one of the prophecies concerning the coming of Christ was that he came to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Acts 26, 18. So one of the things the gospel did for us was open our eyes to see. And we could say, once I was blind, but now I see. And just what happened to that poor man in John's gospel, when the Lord Jesus sent him to the pool, he came seeing. And when we came to Calvary, when we came to Christ, he gave us the ability now to see things as they really are. We're surrounded by people who are blind, and we need to be their eyes for them and to show them the glories of Christ. And then number seven, from sinful to righteous. I think because we live in a sinful world, we sort of get inoculated to sin. The Lord Jesus wasn't. When he was on the cross and all our sin was placed on him, he felt the full brunt of every sin. We can hardly imagine what this means. We read these names in the Bible or in the Atlas, all these countries, these nations full of sinners, full of sin, and every sinner, their sin was brought against the Lord Jesus, wave upon wave, all your waves and billows came over me, says the Lord. And the Lord Jesus bore that, the sins of the whole world. One sin would have sunk a world to hell. For one sin, Adam and Eve were cast out of the presence of God. For one sin, the angels were cast out of heaven. And yet all these sins, sin upon sin, laid on Christ. And so when we read that God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, we should never underestimate what that means. The other side of the equation, however, is that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As sinful and wicked and dirty and filthy and rotten as I was, God now sees me in Christ, dressed in the robes of righteousness and accepted in the beloved one. And to use a good biblical phrase, three cheers for God. Like that is the ultimate wow factor that we've been taken out of sin and brought into righteousness before God, a righteous standing in the presence of a holy God. And with that, number eight, condemned to justified. A lot of people walking down the street don't get this. They're condemned already. They don't have to wait till the last trial when they stand before God and think they're going to come off with some clever defense. 
The Bible says that every mouth will be gagged. Every mouth will be stopped. They'll have nothing to say. God will have all the evidence. He'll be able to play back their lives. And the Bible says that he'll be able to show them condemning others for the very sins that they've committed. So they'll be condemned out of their own mouths. So the Bible says that this world is condemned already. The wrath of God abides on him. In other words, the wrath of God's hanging over people's heads, just held back by the slender thread of his grace. That's where sinners are. And so we were in that company of those who were condemned already. But God, through Christ, has justified us. And to be justified means that as a judge, he has rightfully declared me right because Christ has paid my debt and I've accepted his substitutionary work. So Romans 5.18 says, Through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification. Number nine, from being an enemy to being reconciled. Colossians 1.21, And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. You notice that the battle was in the mind. There was something wrong, stinking thinking. We didn't think right about God. We didn't trust him. We didn't believe him. We didn't think right about ourselves. We didn't think we were all that bad. And we didn't think right about the way we could be saved. We thought we could fix our own problem, join a local church, do a few good works, everything would be good to go. We needed to have that revealed to us. Our minds were our own worst enemies. And we needed the Word of God to invade our thinking and recalibrate us so we could actually think the way God thinks. That's what repentance is. And when we change our mind to accept God's diagnosis of our problem and the revelation of the answer in Christ and his death at Calvary, then all of a sudden we can move from being enemies of God in our minds to being reconciled, brought into alignment with the way God thinks, which of course is the right way to think. And then number 10, from lost to found. The beautiful story of the prodigal son. These are the words of the father who rejoices when his boy comes home. And he says, it's right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. A person who's lost, in the story of the prodigal son, he wasn't lost to the far country. He wasn't lost to the pleasures of the world. He wasn't lost to his party 50 cent friends. What was he lost to? He was lost to the father, lost to the father's house, to the joy and blessing of the father's house, lost to the feasting, lost to the inheritance. He'd lost it all. And so people in the world don't feel lost. But you know, if you talk to a person sitting by the side of the road and they're looking at the map, and you say, where, where are you? And they say, I don't know. Well, where'd you come from? Well, I don't know. Well, where are you headed? Well, I don't know. <laughs> They're lost. You can talk to the university professors down the road here. They don't know where they came from. They think they came from a mud puddle. And they don't know where they're going. They don't even sure there's anything out there. They have no idea where they are. That's what you call lost, man. They're lost. And only the Lord can bring us home. I tell you this, when we come to ourselves like the prodigal son and we set our faces for the father's house, he will run down the road. The only time we ever hear about God being in a hurry is when the father runs down the road to receive the prodigal. What a glorious story. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're saved today, this has all happened to you. Let's rejoice in it. Let's thank God for it. Let's share it with our neighbors, because they can get in on this too. There's nothing like it. This is the best story in all the world. And God has provided it all in the Lord Jesus Christ.